Hello friends, I'm David Moskin, here for the Friends of Lake Warner in Hadley, Massachusetts. Following my little presentation, you're going to hear five speakers from local organizations and the University of Massachusetts talk about good land management if your land is near a stream or a lake. So please um, take a look and I think you're going to find the five presentations very interesting. Uh, this was, the presentations were from a workshop put on by, by the Hampton Hampshire Conservation District and that was Marilyn Castriata in, um, putting this together with us, the Friends of Lake Warner and Jason Johnson, our executive director. So please take a look at the presentations and especially if you own land near a stream or a lake, I think you're gonna find them very uh, educational and instructive. Thank you very much. This presentation is from Jason Johnson, the executive director of the Friends of Lake Warner here in Hadley, Massachusetts. Jason's been with the Friends for six or seven years. He's a wetlands biologist and he'll talk on the condition of the lake and the stream here in Hadley, Massachusetts. The subjects he speaks about are relevant to anybody that lives near a stream or a lake. Please listen to Jason. Thanks everyone. Um, I just wanted to thank the uh, North Hadley Church for having us and for the New Hampshire Conservation District for sponsoring and organizing the, the workshop. Um, I just wanted to give you a little background about our organization. We are the only group that advocates for the lake and the river and watershed. Um, we do water quality monitoring and work on invasive plant removal on the pond. Um, we're lucky enough to have a pond that is not that developed, so we don't have a whole lot of lake of butters. Um, we have some large farmland and wildlife conservation area abutting us. This is the watershed. Um, the lake is down around here. UMass Amherst is over here. A more urbanized section of the watershed. We have a considerable amount of farmland right along the main stem here, and then up in Shootsbury and um, Leverett are the forest parts of the watershed. Um, this land has been farmed. The, the dam first went in in 1670, so this dam has been and lake has been here longer than any other structure in the watershed. Um, and all the houses and civilization that came afterwards was built up around it, so it has a long history of being a prominent part of the landscape. Uh, it was home to the first grist mill in this part of the valley. Uh, this is actually a shot of the third grist mill here after two others were destroyed by fire. This one was destroyed in 1925. And this is the broom tool factory and knife making shop of Caleb Dickinson and John Howe um, that was across the river on the other side. Both of those businesses were run entirely on water power. Uh, we have bought a bunch of conservation land in this critical habitat. Uh, the lake is down here. You can see a big green corridor leading all the way up into Shootsbury and up into the Plotman Reservoir area. Uh, so this area is very important ecologically as a corridor for wildlife and as a resting spot for migratory waterfowl that's close to the Connecticut River. Uh, the problem that we have in Lake Warner is eutrophication. Eutrophication is nutrient enrichment. This is mostly nitrogen and phosphorus. Uh, which is present in the water column. It's coming in from the tributaries. Uh, you have problems with reduced transparency, low dissolved oxygen, and excessive plant growth, uh, algae blooms. So this usually happens over a period of hundreds of years in a natural condition. And when we have development and activities in the watershed that are contributing additional nutrients, it can really accelerate so it can be tens of years. So we've seen dramatic changes in the lake over the last hundred years really is where it's, it's really accelerated. Um, we have fairly clear conditions in the early summer and the spring and early summer and then again in the fall. And these are characterized in what's known as the mesotrophic range, so not quite eutrophic with um, the water column being completely obscured. But in summertime, July, usually it starts to kick off. We get big algae blooms and excessive plant growth that almost covers the entire lake surface. There's a 
aerial photograph from 2016, which was a drought year, so the water was really low. You can see that the, the surface of the lake is just almost completely covered. Uh, we take temperature readings on the lake throughout the spring and summer and into the fall. Uh, last year was an exceptionally wet year, and so we had lower than average temperatures with big spikes here when we had big rainstorms. We look at dissolved oxygen throughout the water column. Um, you can see here, even at the lowest levels of the lake, the water, the dissolved oxygen is still really high. And then as soon as the plant growth starts to obscure the, the surface, it starts to drop off in the lowest regions. And um, this is the two meter region is dropping off by July. Uh, we still have good dissolved oxygen in the upper meter of the, of the lake and a good majority of the lake is less than three feet deep. So there's still plenty of habitat that's available, but a good portion of the deeper sections of the lake is virtually dead in the middle of summer. Uh, we look at transparency. Last year, transparency was really good because we had a considerable amount of rain, so there was a lot of freshwater inputs. Um, again, transparency is sort of re related back to eutrophic conditions. Our transparency was not that bad except between July, June, and August here. Uh, we've been looking at phosphorus trends over the long term. Uh, there were some studies that were done in the early 2000s, trying to get an idea of lake loading and how much the lake could actually tolerate. Um, 2017, 2018 were really high water years, and so we had accelerated erosion and considerable and levels that were just really elevated. And this is looking at phosphorus in tributaries, also above ecological thresholds, that essentially is telling you how much it's going to take for excessive plants and algae to begin to grow. Uh, Tanbrook is draining most of Amherst and urban areas. Uh, Knightley Brook is draining right in the center of the watershed. Um, it comes into the lake above, and the Mill River represents a lot of the ag land that, uh, that is draining and contributing to the main stem. Uh, we also look at bacteria levels for health and recreational purposes. Uh, our coli bacteria levels were, were elevated in the last two years that we've been sampling. Uh, historically, the wastewater treatment plant used to dump into the Mill River, which caused a lot of sedimentation of organic nutrients. Uh, the Mill River was also straightened to build Highway 116, which is uh, just increase the, the drainage and, and runoff that, um, that comes from the rest of the watershed. So looking at some of the restoration techniques, maybe looking at sinuosity here, increasing some of the area where floodwaters can be stored and wetland rehabilitation. Uh, we're getting a lot of drainage from UMass parking lots and urban stormwater from Amherst. Urban, uh, Amherst is dealing with their stormwater infrastructure, and Hadley is also looking at upgrading their stormwater infrastructure along um, the Route 47 corridor. So that's an important component for healing some of the runoff issues. Um, and for our ag, we're really looking to design drainage systems so that the water runs more, more slowly and stays on the landscape more than running off directly into the tributaries. Uh, this is part of our invasive plant collection. And really, the, the message here is that it's important to do more uh, restoration and reducing nutrients that are contributing into the watershed rather than having to clean them up after they get into the lake, because this becomes a very expensive and um, laborious effort to be to have to deal with the after effects of, of eutrophication. Thank you. And I'm looking forward to hearing our other speakers. This presentation is by Masood Hashemi, a professor at the University of Massachusetts. Masood's research is largely around farms and growers and best practices for farms to increase production while protecting the land and the water and the other natural resources around the farm. I think you'll find Masood's presentation particularly interesting. 
Um, thanks for inviting me. Um, I was told to talk about cover cropping. Of course, this is my favorite topic, but it requires a lot of time, not just half an hour. I can talk over and over, right? Uh, so, but before I talk about cover crops, I, I really like to introduce uh, some facts about the soil because the soil is the foundation of life on the planet and uh, uh, all living organisms are dependent on whether directly or indirectly to the soil. And, uh, <coughs> and some of the major soil functions, uh, we already know that it provides food, feed, fiber, shelter through the plants that we grow in the, plant, in the soil. However, uh, there are some many, many, many other functions that um, many of them are, um, are known to you guys. Uh, the, it's a nature's recycling system. Um, without soy, um, we would have problems with the nutrients because, um, because we have limited uh, resources of uh, nutrients and therefore uh, the, the, remain, the remain of the animals and uh, the plants and human beings and other um, smaller organisms, they all recycle and therefore it makes life going on. Purifies water, regulates water flow, release and transport many chemical compounds and the list goes on and on and on. However, the point is not all, not all, not all soils are the same and, uh, and not all soils function uh, the way I just <coughs> Gave you the list. This is a very good soil. It's, uh, it's uh, covered with plants. It's a very fluffy structure. And if you take a soil sample and put it under the microscope, you see uh, um, a lot of uh, microorganisms in the soil. Whereas in comparison, you have this soil, which uh, probably doesn't do any of those functions that I just gave you the list. Uh, it's very really compacted and very efficient in the nutrients and very low in organisms and therefore it doesn't perform any function. So when we're talking about soil, we're really talking about the healthy soils. And some of the benefits from healthy soils is the sustainability. If we are into, if we are into farming system, is the sustainability and resiliency of farming. If we are into, just we just mentioned it, uh, Jason just mentioned, talking about water quality because healthy soil wouldn't, uh, wouldn't allow any runoff. Actually the water will penetrate and therefore we're not going to have things like this algae bloom situation. And also it buffers uh, the extreme changes in environment whether it's a it's drought or whether it's a temperature fluctuations. So the, all of those things are uh, the benefits of having a healthy soil. And, our, and the health of the soil is primarily depends on the organisms in the soil. Some of them are very uh, obvious, like uh, worms, for instance, the spiders, and, uh, uh, and some other, you know, that the beetles, uh, we can see there. But the majority of the organisms in the soil uh, cannot be seen by naked eyes, so we need organisms. And actually, these are the organisms that perform most of the fo soil functions. Uh, these unicellular or one cell organisms, they do most of those things that I just mentioned. Now, these guys require, of course, require water, they, they require food, and they require uh, air, and so we, I'll talk about that in a very, uh, in a, uh, very shortly. Uh, but the problem is, with all of those importance and the functions of the soil which our life depends on, the soil is the most neglected natural resource that we have. And I'll give you some examples. When, you, when we see this problem with the water, that raises questions, that raises concern, and we say we have to do something about it, right? When we see this fish, <coughs> fish kill and that sort of uh, messy, situation in our water, we say we have to do something about it. When we see this extreme uh, pollution, um, it's sad and it raises questions and so we will find some way to deal with this. 
or when we see this <coughs> air pollution, it's unacceptable because we may pass some regulation, but at least we know that there are some pollution is going on. That's, but when it comes to the soil, a lot of things that we do with the soil seem so normal. So we never, never concern about it, and we never do anything about it. Uh, a few examples. When we see this uh, field, we think that it's pretty normal. The farmer has, has harvested the crop and, well, waited until the next spring and so they can plant something else. That is not normal because in the spring, the same field looks like this. If you, if you leave the soil like that, we end up with this huge erosion. When we see this, even right now, if you drive around and you see a lot of cornfields like this, right? you say, okay, that's normal. Um, for generations, we had this situation. We harvest the corn uh, sometimes in late September, and then we plant corn again, maybe in late May, maybe sometimes early June, and it seems everything seems normal. We're not going to do anything about it. Whereas this is not really normal because First of all, there are so much free stuff in the air that we are not using for seven months, from October to, to May. There's, there are carbon, free carbon, free um, light, free nitrogen, and we're not going to use it. And that's not normal. And whereas if we had some plants growing in this field, they could capture those free stuff from the air, bring it back into the soil, and then feed the microbes that we are so dependent on. So for seven months, the microbes will suffer from hunger, whereas there are free stuff in the air, and we're not using it. Uh, so this is this is a uh, field, the same situation. The corn harvested is very severe erosion going on. The same field with a plant growing on it, and of course this, the picture says, you know, whatever I I was going to say. The soil is healthy, no erosion, the snow melts, the, the rainfall, they just penetrate into the soil because of the channels that the roots are creating, but at the same time they are feeding the microbes. Remember, the microbes are more dependent on the root of the plants, root of growing plants than anything else, because the plants will uh, release the exudates about 30% about sometimes a little bit more about 30% of what plant makes through photosynthesis they exudate to the soil just to make those microbes happy okay so the microbes are so dependent on the exudates from the growing plants not the residues of the plant and definitely not something like this so it's very important to have growing plants when we see this picture, many of us think that this is normal, that's what agriculture is all about. You have to plow it, and then you have to disk it. No matter, we make some dust, that's part of the agriculture. We're not going to do anything, we're not going to pass any regulation, because we think this is so normal. And this is the severe uh, example of the producing dust and uh, eroding the soil. So. I'm sure that you remember the hurricane flag, Irene, and for several months the Connecticut River, Valley, uh, Connecticut River was like this, right? The question is, if you have such a green state, and this Connecticut River is coming from Vermont and New Hampshire, and if they are not greener than Massachusetts, they are as green as Massachusetts, and then the question is, where those mud is coming from? Right? <coughs> I leave it to you. It's all from their soil, till soil, that contributes to the pollution. When we see this, we think that's normal. Students are taking shortcut, right? It's pretty normal. But what we really, if we really think about it, you see that even 
student like 150 pounds, maybe 160 pounds, at most 200 pounds, creating such a compaction that even grasses that are so tolerant to compaction, they're not growing. Then if that's the case, what about this? That, that compacts even so more, much more than a human being, right? And if you think that this is huge, look at this. This is really, if you go to Midwest, this is a normal size machinery that they compact soil all the time. So my point is, there are so many things that seem normal, so we're not going to do anything about it compared with other resources that we have, air, water. So, the, so the, the, in, in, in brief, the soil should be covered at all time, with no exception. So when we harvest something, we have to plant something that we call it cover crop before we plant another, another crop. So that should be done. And once we have covered soil, that covered soil will provide all kinds of benefits to our ecosystems. Um, that's, a, that's a very nice picture because the soil is covered with a beautiful pasture and uh, and uh, so that cover feeds the cows, but also at the same time, what we don't see, they feed in microbes more than they feed the cows. And everybody's happy. Neighbors are happy. Cows are happy. The owner is happy. Customers are happy. So that's the way it should be. So most of us already know that the key to the soil health in order to perform all of those functions that we expect from soil is organic matter. Um, that's, that's a soil that is covered with the residues. Well, yes, it's much better than bare soil, but this is just a passive protection from the soil. So it, it, to, to some degree, it provides some protection from erosion, but it's not what I meant with covering the soil, okay? So yes, it protects the soil to some degree, but what, I, what, what we need is an active protective blanket, which not only protects the soil, but also feeds the soil. So we have to have growing plants, and like I said, those growing plants, uh, if it's not our crop, we call them cover crop. So, Cover crops, there are all kinds of cover crops. And there are a very long list of benefits. It's funny because we know about cover crops since um, 2000 years ago. A lot of, even 2000 years ago, they, were, they knew there are some legumes that if you grow them, they are as good as manure. They already know that. And we all already know that cover crop in order to protect the soil from erosion is something, is not a new concept. However, every day we find some benefit. Every day we find some new benefit of growing cover crops. Uh, I, I don't want to go through all of those, but it's erosion control, which is very obvious. But it also, the, as I just mentioned, those living plants feed the microbes. And they, when we're talking about microbial activity, that's a combination of activity, the way we know it, but also the population. Population and activity is called activity. And diversity, okay? For many, many, many years, including myself, we thought that organic matter is the residues that we leave behind on the, on the soil. So the more residues that we add to the soil, that means translating to the higher organic matter. Now, it's been a just recently, maybe in the last five, six years, we just found out, no, those organic matter that comes from the residues, those are not, those are temporary. Those are not permanent organic matter. They will be burned into CO2 and go, go into the atmosphere. The real organic matter, the permanent organic matter is nothing but dead microbes. So the more microbes we have in the soil, that means we have more organic matter. So in order to have more organic matter, that means we have to promote the diversity and
and the population of the microbes because when they die, their cell wall becomes a permanent organic matter. Nothing will turn them into carbon dioxide. And those are the things that we need to do. And the cover crops, no matter what kind, they are really uh, expert in feeding the microbes, increasing in the population and the diversity. So, they fix in atmospheric nitrogen, some of them, they uh, recovering some, some of the leftover nutrients, which otherwise will be end up into our water bodies, and the, some of them suppressing weeds, reducing soil compaction, and the list of benefits is just going on and on. Um, by definition, cover crops are the crops that we grow in between harvest and the planting of the new crop, and they usually are not for harvest. So we, it's just for all of those benefits that I just mentioned. Um, they could be any, any crop, legumes, non-legumes, grasses, non-grasses, um, but my point is, if we, if we believe that cover crops are the major feeder of the microbes which are so essential to the health of the soil, then we should have a mix, because a mixed cover crop will satisfy the larger groups and diverse microbes, okay? And um, this is, these are examples, some of the examples of the diverse cover crops. And yes, with the diverse cover crops, we are not providing the maximum of a single benefit. So that means if we are into say nitrogen fixation, maybe this is not fixing as much nitrogen as much as if you're planting just legume. Okay? If you are thinking about pollination, maybe this one is not as effective as if you have a pure monoculture sunflower. However, when you have a mix, then it maximizes the overall ecological benefits. So that is uh, the power of the diversity, okay? Uh, I want to show you something. So this is the root, this is, first of all, this is uh, made possible with a, a new mini rhizotron. So they took a picture of the root of the canola in, in the soil. That was in May 3rd, right? And then they planted the soybean into it. In July, look at that. The, the, the next crop, which is soybean, actually penetrates its root right exactly where the channel is created by the previous crop. So that means they are spending less energy to expand their root system, but also they can penetrate deeper and deeper into the soil. Okay? Now, we have that kind of thing with them cover crop roots, and then we have those, which are channels made by the worms, right? And, do, and guess what we do? We're destroying all of those channels. We're destroying all of those beautiful channels that help our crop, and, uh, and that is not acceptable, okay? So, a few examples. Um, of terminating cover crops because one of the issues with the cover crops uh, in the spring is okay, we, we enjoyed it, we protected the soil, now it's time to plant our own crop. But the cover crop is tall, what we can do? Well, um, in, in the past, people were using glyphosate, in the past, people were using this and plowing and that sort of thing to incorporate residues of the cover crop. Well, there are many, many other, this is a very simple way to, to deal with the termination of the cover crops. Beautiful, look at, <clears throat> it breaks, when you're using that, it breaks uh, the stem, as you can see, it breaks the stem, the xylem, and therefore uh, the root and shoot are not connected anymore. And within, within a week, depends on the cover crop, with anywhere between a week to almost two weeks, the, the cover crop will die. And the residue of the cover crop 
is very nicely can like a carpet capture on the soul. Okay? Now, when you have such a beautiful situation, and then this is the old planter. It's not that I mean, so some people say, oh, I don't have money to buy. They don't have to buy it. This is the old planter. All they have to do is just modify it with a couple of hundred dollars, and they can actually plant right into the residues of those dense cover crop. You don't believe it? Look at this. This is the same cornfield, and of course, the residues of the cover crop are still there. They protect the soil from erosion. They also they protect soil from evaporation, so they can stand much, much longer uh, in drought condition. But also, they, they don't need any weed control. No herbicides, nothing. And it's weed-free, completely weed-free. Compare this to this one. Low organic matter, all of those cross is the, the indication of the low organic matter, all of those <coughs> weeds. And the greener, the green color of those is because of the chemical, chemical fertilizer, nothing else. Whereas this one, they didn't spend one pound of fertilizer. It all came from the, uh, the, the nutrients released gradually by the color crops. Uh, they planted it. It's not just corn, as you can see, cucumber and squash are planted exactly the same, uh, exactly the same uh, approach and the same tactic. So, with the cover crops, we maximize the carbon input. So we bring in carbon from the atmosphere and we maximize the carbon input into our, into our soil. And plus, if we and this, at the same time, we minimizing the carbon loss because of the tillage and uh, that sort of things, then it's really a, a home run. So you're maximizing the input and you're minimizing the loss. And that is called carbon farming. Okay? So a combination of cover cropping plus no to the system is the best thing that may happen to a soil. Okay? And a healthy soil is really, I, I believe, that so is a solution to the triple crisis of food, energy, and climate. Okay? Um, that's my last, that's my last uh, slide that shows, this is Steve Groff, somebody uh, who, was, who has used a uh, no-till system for many, many years and cover cropping, and just it shows the difference between a corn, the same, the same field next to each other, a corn that was planted in no-till system with cover crop, and the corn with no cover crop and conventional tillage. And you can see when we have drought situation, the corn started to look like this, whereas the other corn, which seems pretty normal and healthy. So that's the difference between a no-till plus cover crop Thank you. Any questions? Question. Yes. Yeah, that was great, Mr. Um, I have a question about voles, voles in the you know underneath the cover crop residue for mm -hmm. certain crops. Is that a big? Can that be a problem in terms of crop crop damage, damaging the roots? Um, um, well, it depends on location. Yeah. Honestly, I have not seen or heard about extreme danger or situation of the woods. Okay. Good. I haven't seen it. Great. This part of the workshop was a presentation by Jono Niger. Jono has a company called Regenerative Design Group that does very creative things with uh, primarily people's backyards, including miniature forests and other um, interrelational plantings that bring predator uh, insects in and pollinator insects in. You'll find Jono's presentation very interesting. Hello there. Welcome back. So I'm John O'Neiger uh, with Regenerative Design Group in Greenfield, Massachusetts. And so um, I work with a lot of different landowners and uh, different kind of scales from uh, urban 
farm kinds of projects to uh, suburban homesteads and uh, all food systems and uh, water systems, going out to broad scale farm planning, uh, soil improvement practices. Uh, so in addition to Regenerative Design Group now, I'm also uh, working on a project just up the river a few miles uh, in Sunderland with a, a chestnut agroforestry project. Uh, unfortunately, I won't be able to talk much about that, but it'll be, of course, a chestnut picture. So um, this is, uh, as uh, was talked about earlier, uh, the, uh, the Lake Warner Mill River watershed. It's a very diverse watershed. Um, and the question I have for you all is, where do you live in this watershed? And is it up high in the, in the uplands? Is it down low in the floodplain? Uh, is it in the very urbanized areas? Suburban zones where there's houses, yards, small lots, or in some of the agricultural zones with larger properties, different kinds of management practices. And what are some of the practices that are happening there that could be improved or change that would make a difference in the, in the water quality uh, problems that are being faced here. Uh, so we're going to just jump through a whole bunch of different topics, uh, kind of centrally around permaculture, but also just broadly on um, land care in a little bit more of the um, suburban or homeowner uh, scale because uh, I think that's the focus for tonight. Uh, so the framework that I often use is permaculture. Have, have some of you all heard of permaculture? Yeah. A little bit? So there's a lot of different definitions. Uh, the one that I often fall back on as a, as a more simple, uh, straightforward uh, definition is it's a design system. Uh, it's about ecological living, about how we live uh, on the land uh, tr and integrating all the different aspects of our lives, plants, animals, buildings, people, communities, all of it, how does it all come together? And there's a focus generally on creating production, creating a, a, a taking care of the needs that we have, uh, but also to create beautiful uh, environments uh, and also to steward and care for uh, the land and all the um, beings that are here. And so we have the permaculture flower, which really is, gives a sense of its whole system's design, thinking about the built environment, tools, technology, culture, health and well-being, finance and economics, land tenure, land stewardship. All these pieces have to come together uh, to work uh, together. So I'm going to go is it, uh, forward. So, uh, what we're doing, some more big ideas, big picture ideas, is again, as I said, we're really provide, take, how do we take care of ourselves within our communities, providing yields. We, we need to feed ourselves and clothe ourselves and have our buildings, homes. Uh, uh, but we're also thinking about providing for wildlife and pollinators, uh, thinking about cycling of waste and nutrients. Uh, as Masoud said, the um, cycling of nutrients um, so it stays on the land instead of going into waterways. Uh, water, which we'll talk a little bit more about in a bit, uh, is a, um, really some of the principles there are slowing the water going off the land, uh, spreading it out instead of it being focused and concentrated where it's causing erosion, uh, getting it spread out and sinking it down into the ground, infiltrating it. Uh, so that it can filter through the soil. Okay, and, and so all of this is really um, mimicking nature. It's about thinking about how does nature do things and how can what we do be more like what nature does. Because really in nature there is no pollution. There's, um, everything gets consumed and cycled back in. Uh, and that's really what we want to be doing. So uh, the idea of providing a yield uh, is how do we in integrate all of these different things, food, fuel, fiber, fodder, pharmaceuticals, fertilizer, and fun. And we're trying to create that productive landscape. So here's an idea, just the range of different ways to incorporate uh, food and production uh, um, and taking care of our needs. 
uh, edible landscaping, just having, having what we're going to use right around our homes and bringing that production right into our home space. Uh, vegetable gardens and greenhouses, uh, orchards, uh, agroforestry, when you get out into the larger landscape, agroforestry is a system of integrating tree crops with either livestock or other kinds of crops, so intercropping. Uh, it's, it's, a, um, it's a way of thinking about perennial agriculture uh, systems that um, provide a lot of these different benefits, uh, both to the soil by having perennial crops there instead of using tillage, uh, but, and then also having multiple crops happening at once. Um, so uh, forest gardening, which we'll talk on, uh, touch on in a little bit, is a system of mimicking a forest uh, in our gardens and using the principles of mimicking nature um, and trying to make our um, food producing spaces uh, super productive with less effort and less waste. Uh, and aquaculture, aquaponic systems, uh, incorporating water uh, and production in a water system. So lots of different ways it can incorporate um, um, yields. So this is a, um, an example of a intensive greenhouse. is a project that we've been working at in Conway for many years, 10 years now, uh, Wildside Gardens. Uh, and here on the property, an eight acre property, is a um, earth burned greenhouse. Uh, so you can see the front um, facing south and the back. Here's the back with a green roof just getting established. Uh, and so small scale intensive system uh, meant to really help balance out the, um, the um, uh, cold winter and buffer the, buffer the winter weather and provide that season extension in the early in the season, right about now, and then later into fall as well. So I mentioned the edible forest garden. This is a really interesting strategy for um, lots of different settings from a small backyard going up to multiple acres. Uh, the idea of um, how could our gardens be a, more like a forest? The way a forest has lots of different layers from ground covers and shrubs and small trees, uh, vines going up. Uh, it has openings and gaps and um, there's um, water um, is infiltrated in the ground, there's uh, no erosion uh, in a forest generally. Um, there's just a lot of cycling of nutrients, provides all those things with very few inputs. So there's a whole exploration of how can we create these kinds of gardens. And so here is, this is at Wildside Gardens again. Here it is about 10 years on an east facing slope. Uh, here's the looking up into that slope and what we're creating here is a kind of mid-succession forest setting. So there's a lot of light available, there's lots of gaps, uh, there's fruit trees, uh, there's fruiting shrubs, there's um, some taller trees off to the north and getting um, smaller as you go down. It looks kind of like an old field, like an abandoned field, right? This is not your domesticated, uh, very well manicured site. This is a robust, diverse growing system uh, that we're just steering uh, generally, not, not in total control. So it's kind of fun, kind of interesting, and there's a lot of um, different applications of edible forest gardens. And so here's a, an example of putting together a forest garden is in what we call guilds or groupings of plants. So generally, uh, or often it's around a a tree such as a fruit tree, the pear tree here, and then thinking about what are the other layers that could be incorporated. So this is sort of a simplified pear fruit tree layer and a ground cover layer with some of these um, ground covers providing uh, the functions of um, food, improving soil, reducing weeds, um, and you're and getting harvest from them such as the mint. Uh, sea kale is a perennial vegetable from coastal areas of northern Europe, uh, super um, uh, easy to grow, perennial. Uh, you can eat the leaves, but you can also, which is pretty interesting, you can eat the broccolis. So right about now, well, they're just coming out right now, but in the next few weeks, as those flowers start to come out, uh, you can cut those off um, and eat them 
um, basically as a broccoli, but it's a perennial crop that comes back year after year. So we're reducing the need to do the, the, um, all the work for those of you who grow broccoli of sowing the seeds, growing the starts, putting them out in the field, taking care of them, harvesting the broccoli. Here's a perennial crop that functions the same way. And then if you let some of the flowers go, they actually act as an insectary plant and uh, support a lot of pollinators. So uh, similarly, it's sort of an example of a very mixed ground cover uh, with different edible greens uh, mixed in as part of a guild um, grouping. All right, so the forest garden, lots of abundance. Um, here's an example of some of the harvest. Uh, this is in my place up in uh, Leverett, not too far from here. So uh, red currants, um, gummies, and, and some different kind of shrub cherries, nanking cherry, uh, nitrogen fixers, Asian pears. Uh, so lots of potential harvest uh, that can come out of these kind of systems. Okay, and uh, tree crops as we get into the broader scale and uh, with more space. Uh, this is uh, some pictures of chestnut. These are blight resistant Chinese chestnuts and Chinese chestnut hybrids. Uh, super productive, more as an agricultural crop. Uh, not so much a reforestation, restoration of the American chestnut into the woods, which I think is really important work. But this is really a crop that's suitable for uh, rocky, stony hillsides, uh, um, can, is super tolerant of um, drier, poor soil conditions, and can be integrated into, as I was talking about, agroforestry systems, uh, either uh, ranging livestock underneath, uh, or doing alley cropping, where if the trees are spread far enough apart, uh, you can grow crops in between. So um, there's lots of possibilities. Uh, so there's an initiative right now to develop um, tr uh, chestnuts as a viable industry in the um, Western Mass and in the Valley here. So if you know of people who are might be inclined or open to planting chestnut trees, we're looking for people who want to grow them on their land. It's a long-term proposition. We're talking these trees will grow for many, many decades, um, be producing 100 years or more. Okay, so, but in the, so zoom back down into the home, the home zone, the suburban home zone, and I have to thrash on lawns a little bit, because um, this is really a, a problem uh, in the amount of lawns that we have, and there's a lot of, there's some statistics about um, lawns in the U.S., 40 million acres, uh, the size of New York State roughly, you know, lots of gas that get used, gets used to maintain these lawns, lots of pesticides, uh, uh, a lot of pollution coming off of lawnmowers, uh, a lot of water use going to landscaping. It's just a lot of energy use. Um, I think we could do better, I guess. You know, I think the point is that there's a lot of other things we can do uh, with our time, our energy. Um, not to say that we don't need spaces to um, play on. Yeah, let's go ahead. Um, that we don't need zones to play on, you know, um, run around on, sit in the sun. That I'm not a purist to say that we don't, shouldn't have any lawns. Is that, you know, maybe one option is a smaller amount of lawn space. And that we think about diversifying our landscapes and having a lot of other things happening. Meadows, uh, ground covers. This is you know, hay-scented fern, though some of you might um, not just like hay-scented fern. Once it gets going, it's pretty aggressive. But you know what? That creates a low-maintenance landscape. If you want low maintenance, you actually need plants that are fairly aggressive, uh, that can hold their own. Uh, they can be really beautiful. This is sort of more of like a, um, a, a garden, but a little bit more on the edge of a meadow, so it's not such a crimped and preened garden. It's more of a, um, a wilder uh, meadow type space. Um, and I think that offers a lot of opportunity for um, letting some of these spaces become more diverse, um, even moving towards that, what I was showing, the pictures of the forest gardens, the edible forest gardens. So, um, so there's more that we can be doing, uh, including incorporating wildlife habitat into the landscapes. Um, it's super important. Uh, this is my property uh, up in Leverett, and um, 
It may just look like an unkept forest edge to you where I got lazy and stopped managing it um, and that you'd be right. Um, but no, actually, it's a, um, this is, oh, there's a lot of habitat happening here. This is a maple tree that we um, cut out partly because it was uh, shading the uh, side of our house and we wanted to open up our southern exposure. So instead of cutting it down right to the ground, we cut it off, it's about 18 feet there. Uh, it's starting to, uh, this is about five years now, and so the bark is starting to peel off. The um, woodpeckers are coming in, they're gonna start creating cavities in there. It's got a whole nother life that's gonna happen after it dies. This is an amazing thing. Standing dead trees or snags are a really important part of the ecosystem of our, our environment. And we have a thing in our culture about getting rid of these things, cleaning it up. And, and there are dozens of bird species that require cavities to nest in. And a lot of those birds are declining because of lack of habitat right now, lack of cavity nesting. And you need to have trees that are uh, 18, 20 inches or larger uh, to get in order to get some of these cavities going. And so um, we can actually create those in the landscapes that we live in. You know, maybe not right next to our house or next to a path that we walk on a lot. You know, there's safety considerations. But uh, in addition, um, that brushy edge and also that's a rock pile, it's a little hard to tell, a, a pop, stones. Those are all great elements for habitat um, on the landscape. And it's important to have a lot of that there. Um, also, um, room for pollinators is getting a lot of attention now. It's really exciting uh, that we're realizing that um, pollinators are important. In order to have pollinators, you have to have some of these unkept edges. You have to have some of these meadow spaces uh, and, and having a lot of diversity. Our strategy is to really um, have some planted zones where we're putting some things in, and then we have a lot of zones where there's uh, um, plants are coming and going as they want. Uh, Anise hyssop is one of those where uh, you can get it going and then it'll begin to just kind of seed around. Um, great for tea, but it's also an amazing pollinator support plant. It um, flowers for a long, long time. Anybody recognize this flower here? Uh, ice cap hydrangea. <laughs> no, no, not ice cap hydrangea. No, it's a mountain mint. Pycnanthemum. Uh, species. It's a, it's a really exceptional uh, mint relative that grows a little bit higher, three to four feet high. And uh, we've been planting it around and it supports just this astounding diversity of insects on it. It's just amazing. I uh, don't know the name of this wasp there, um, but it has a really iridescent shine to it. And there's a spider hiding out in the yarrow. Um, so lots of diversity, lots of life there. Uh, Okay, so um, the, you know, one of the facets of um, permaculture and this kind of edible landscaping, sustainable landscaping, ecological landscaping is um, bringing the gardens close to where we live, is having gardens around our homes, um, partly just because it's easier, it's easier to care for them. Uh, this is, again, up at uh, Wildside Gardens at Conway, and so the home is surrounded by gardens, um, gardens for pollinators, uh, gardens for fruit and herbs, um, all within easy reach of the home. And then um, as, the, as you get further and further away, there's larger landscape um, and, and connection to the um, natural area. So this is a wet meadow uh, and there's a, a boardwalk that cuts through there. Oh, go back one, let's see. All right, so coming back to some water management uh, aspects, as I was mentioning, thinking about some of the principles, which is to slow the water down off the land, uh, get it spread out, and, and get it sunk into the, into the ground. And, the, and really what we're aiming for, one of the important principles is the water should be leaving the land that we're on cleaner than when it arrived filtering it. Um, that's part of that is moving it through the soil, uh, um, keeping, keeping, it, um, keeping it held as much as possible. And so this is an example of a water collection distribution system that we worked on uh, at Katie Will Community in Coleraine, which actually now has a new name. 
uh, which I'm not remembering. Um, and so it's a multifaceted system where we're trying to collect and hold the water along the way as many times as possible. So in this case, the uh, water comes off of the roofs and instead of putting gutters on, uh, they gave us the challenge of how can we pick up that water along the base, um, which is what we did. We picked it um, up um, on the ground and then brought it into a tank. So that's about a 550 gallon water tank. So we're trying to create storages, as many storages as possible as high up on the land to be able to use that um, with gravity, ideally, um, to feed down. And then the overflow from the tank goes into a pond, collects and holds there, creates a, a, a beautiful space, a, a, a microclimate, and um, provides some habitat, some opportunities to grow some different kinds of um, aquatic plants, um, edibles and non-edibles. Uh, the overflow from the pond goes down through a swale system. And what this is, is basically uh, trenches, shallow trenches on contour across the slope. And those are meant to slow the water and allow it to go down into the ground instead of uh, rushing down, uh, picking up sediment and heading towards a water body. It's meant to infiltrate it. So these systems of swales are, are a final effort on a fairly steep slope to get that water down into the ground. And uh, we've found them to be very, very effective, uh, in, especially in places where you have good drainage, uh, in some of these hill areas uh, around the edges of the valley. Um, and it's a, um, it's a great strategy in certain conditions. Okay, another one on another water tank system. The other tank I showed was 550 gallons. This is a little bit smaller. It's 350 gallons. It's still quite a bit bigger uh, than you would have to have, what is that, six or seven barrels, 55 gallon barrels, to match a tank like this. And so this is a tank that, um, it's a little hard to pick, see the scale. It's um, about six feet tall and about four feet uh, in diameter, uh, so it's it's large, but it's it it holds a substantial quantity of water, which is needed if you're going to use rainwater uh, for irrigation. The the 55 gallon tanks are good; it's a good start, but it's not a lot of volume if you're really going to substantially use it to get through a drought and uh, and provide water to your garden. So we generally try and scale up the volume of water that we're collecting. Um, this is a gravity feed system, so it just comes out uh, and it's designed so that it goes right down into an orchard uh, and uh, kind of a developing forest garden zone down below. Okay, so still thinking about water and bridging into a, kind of an urban zone in Northampton. Here's a project that we worked on uh, where uh, my friend and colleague Paige Bridgens, small urban lot. This is the north side and this is her driveway. Uh, she had um, uh, not enough space to do all the gardens that she wanted to put in. And she said, well, why should I use all, have all this space on my property covered with asphalt and for parking? And it's also just pushing water off into the storm drain system. So one way we can deal with this is we can actually start to pull up some of the over pavement that we have in our communities and around our homes even, is try to unpave. And it's actually not that hard. Uh, here I am cutting the asphalt between hers and her neighbors because the neighbor didn't want to remove their driveway. Uh, taking up the, uh, the asphalt, digging the sand out, putting it up on free cycle and having um, people who need some sand to come and take it away, filling that up with um, soil and compost and uh, um, um, rock dust to remineralize the soil um, and and voila a year later is a beautiful garden space growing lots of plants so this was her driveway a year ago and um, this is what we can do in our communities some places where we just don't have enough and so not only is it creating more beauty more food but it's also slowing down water that's moving off the land uh, where we have put too much pavement down, too, covered over too much of the ground. 
uh, which is causing huge issues for stormwater uh, management. All right, so yeah, let's just scroll ahead and get all those out. So I just put down a whole list of all these different things. Just I knew you'd be needing something to, to uh, perk you up at the end of the evening here, or later on in the evening. So these are just a lot of different strategies. So, um, you know, we're, as I talked about, trying to mimic ecosystems. How can we use less inputs, less lawn, less labor, less cleanliness? Let it be more diverse, using lots of perennials, using mulches and connections. So it's a lot about repairing damaged sites. That's a lot of what's happening right now. Is, um, we pretty much any land you see around has, uh, is, is degraded and denuded in some fashion or another. That's just centuries of use. That's what we've got. Um, so we need to be doing a lot of restoration, uh, um, harvesting and recycling resources, catching and holding water, as I talked about. Here's one that's really important to me. Um, we have a habit of burning biomass our properties. It's just something that I don't know, people like to do or think they need to do. It's, a, it's an idea of it's that cleanliness thing. Um, really, we don't need to be putting that carbon up into the atmosphere. Really, that carbon is so valuable, that organic matter that's so important. And that organic matter breaks down really fast in, in our humid summers. Uh, and we can have brush piles, you can have brush piles off to the side, you can chop them up smaller if you need them to break down sooner. Um, but I really recommend not burning biomass and looking for ways to incorporate it into the land um, and, and utilizing it on the land, um, really, really important. Um, and important for building soil, right? Biomass, that biomass that we can produce here in this environment, in this temperate zone, that likes to grow trees and lots of stuff. We can use that to build soil. Uh, planting trees and perennials, um, some, some principles about relative location and design and putting all the pieces together so it works really well. Um, using appropriate technologies like electric mowers or other, other um, um, systems that use less energy, right? So look for ways to bring in some new approaches and, uh, and connect to your neighbors. How's our time doing? Uh, we should be wrapping up soon than yours. <laughs> okay. I'm thinking that um, this, this is uh, more like, we could talk about some of these things. I think we should just skip through. I added soil building more to, um, all right, and then that's the last one. So I brought up a lot of different things, covered a lot of ground. Any questions? I saw a term just flashed by there, Verma. Vermicomposting. Vermicompost, what's that? That's composting with worms. Ah. Yeah, yeah. With red wigglers, generally compost worms or barnyard worms. It's a certain type of worm that gets used in uh, worm bins. It makes incredible compost and, it, and it's filled with uh, the microorganisms that are important for re-inoculating the soil and getting that whole soil food web going. This part of the workshop was a presentation by Jonathan Carr. Jonathan created Carr's Cider House here in Hadley, Massachusetts some years ago. Makes a delicious um, hard cider product and other apple related products. Um, Jonathan is doing creative things with his orchards and uh, I think you'll find Jonathan's presentation very interesting whether you're an orchard owner or not. Great. Hi everybody, I'm Jonathan Carr. Um, sorry, I don't have a beautiful PowerPoint presentation. <laughs> yeah. Um, so in any case, as Marilyn said, um, I'm the co-owner of a business called Carr Cider House. Uh, and we're based out of Orchard, just... Uh, if you look out the window, up on, up on that corner, just behind us. Um, which we bought in 2002 and been working hard on. Um, it has about a thousand feet of frontage on, on Lake Warner and hopefully it's uh, largely a benign impact on the, on the water quality. 
Um, and so I thought I would just, I'm just going to touch on a, a brief history of, I guess, the land use of Mount Warner and changes in the orcharding and how we came to our particular uh, orcharding techniques. But um, So I just wanted to go uh, uh, way back in time, uh, because I thought this was pretty cool in case you guys don't know it, to the end of the last ice age, and there was a giant lake that filled this entire valley from Rocky Hill, Connecticut, up to central Vermont. And uh, Mount Warren, of course, was, a, was an island, an archipelago up there. And so, um, you know, depositing fine sandy loam on these slopes and making it a, a lovely place to someday plant an orchard. But uh, you know, talk about a watershed at that point. Um, and so, uh, in the colonial era, um, let's see, Marjorie, don't, don't be too hard on me, but they, the, the wealthy Porter Phelps Huntington family um, owned a lot of the land up on Mount Warner, and we have written records of uh, mixed woodlands, orchards, grazing, and even cultivation of uh, rye grain up there. And so maybe that's kind of some of what Jason showed in his picture of the plot of land up on Mount Warner. Um, and as far as uh, our particular 38 acres go, and records show that um, the orchard was first planted in the 1860s by a couple of brothers by the name of Clark, who aren't related to any of the other Clarks that still have orchards around the Pioneer Valley, interestingly enough. Um, and they bought this land from Sophrenia Granger, who used to own the mill, own a lot of land as well. This was known as Granger's Pond out in that day. Um, and then according to um, Jesse Agassiz, who was born Jesse Scott over here in the farmhouse that the boys first uh, are now, now cleaning up, told me that the original orchard trees were planted with mud uh, dredged up from Lake Warner and put in the, the planting holes. Um, and as you know, historical photos show from that time, uh, Mount Warner was actually completely, like almost denuded of trees. There was a sheep craze in the early mid 1800s. And so perhaps there was some soil degradation there. Maybe that's why they needed to, to drag that mud up the hill to plant the trees. But um, so the, the, the land passed from the Clark brothers to the McCretzkys, who are also the Stockbridges, who founded a little school over in Amherst, and, uh, and to the Mitchell family, who some folks still remember, and the Atkins of Atkins Farm fame, and the Arsenals, and finally to, to us in 2002. And over these um, last 150 years, there's been a lot of changes in the way orchards are, are, are managed. Um, there's been this big, this downward trajectory in tree size from giant standard trees down to, to dwarf trees. Um, and so the full-size trees would have been about 60, 60 trees to the acre. Uh, they would work with teams of horses and, and men with ladders. Um, and over time, you can actually have pictures of the, the landscape changing in the hill where they transition from these big trees and they set up terracing and planted these semi-dwarf trees, which uh, allowed um, hundreds of trees per acre, there were smaller trees, and it represented a kind of an intensification of the embodied energy in the orchard system, where the, the reshaping of the land allowed increased tractor access and uh, mechanization of the orchard tasks. And it also represented an increasing impact on uh, Lake Warner in the form of uh, runoff from uh, fertilizers and from orchard sprays. Uh, and, you know, that one time you had, you had DDT and ALAR and, you know, all kinds of things that were banned and you know found that to be bad, uh, um, but um, and so the, the the trend in orcharding had, at the end of the 20th century has been to turn apple orchards into kind of glorified vineyards at this point, where there's thousands of trees per acre, tightly spaced on trellising systems with herbicide strips, and you know complex uh, spray programs to ward off pests and diseases. Um, and under the right conditions, these are extraordinarily productive systems, but they're also very, you know, capital, chemical, labor intensive, um, with, you know, the drawbacks that these intensifications produce. Uh, so, as we see the, you know, the apple tree size shrinking in orchards over time, we also see a concurrent growth in inputs and resulting like, environmental uh, problems from that. And so, in that tradition, we planted 1,600 uh, dwarf trees in 2006, and it, it, didn't, it didn't go very well at first for us. Um, and so we don't actually, we don't, we don't spray. I, I, don't, I don't like spraying. I got kids running around. I have, I have skepticism about the health of, of spray. So uh, we planted uh, pest and disease resistant apples um, instead. Some of them are modern ones that were developed for the, the Purdue Rutgers uh, uh, 
consortium. And um, it reduces yields, and the apples are ugly, but uh, it doesn't matter because we're squeezing them all into juice and fermenting it or turning it into you know, cider products. And so it's a, it works for us. You know, if you're growing table fruit, you can't, you can't do that. Um, and so we don't use uh, chemical fertilizers either up there because that has a, a detrimental effect on uh, hard cider when it ferments. So we want to slow down the fermentation. That speeds it up. But in any case, Never mind all that, the hungry deer, they had a field day with our trees, they, they roused all the fruit buds, stunted a lot of them, I, you know, I took pot shots with a shotgun, I, I encouraged hunters, I, uh, I built a crazy 3D electric fence that was supposed to confuse them, it didn't work, but in any case, we couldn't afford an $80,000 woven wire fence, uh, and so we decided to change our entire approach to orcharding, orcharding because of this uh, and move away from the modern dwarf orchard system. Um, and so I learned that in Europe and in many parts of the world, there still exist these types of orchards which incorporate uh, you know, fruit or nut trees, but uh, with grazing animals beneath them. Uh, and this is known as a silvopasture or agroforestry, as John mentioned. Um, and in fact, in northern France, particularly in, uh, in Cider dairy region of Normandy, they have these orchards called the uh, Otige or high stem, where they uh, graze cattle and sheep and they make both amazing hard cider and amazing cheese. So it's very inspiring, but it also has it has multiple benefits. You, know, you reduce mowing, you use the fossil fuels, improve soil fertility, and sequesters carbon, um, and provides additional farm products in the form of dairy and meat. So it's a diff diversification for your farm as well, which is important. Um, so we've decided that we're going to emulate these European orchards uh, by planting lower tree densities per acre, ranching high up, out of reach of grazing livestock and nibbling deer, and um, we're also working on uh, experimenting with blocks of high-headed semi-dwarf trees at higher planting densities um, to see if this hybrid approach is, is feasible as well. Um, and then we're going to be bringing in rotational grazing with a small mixed flock of uh, sheep and goats as well uh, at very low stocking densities, so nowhere, nowhere near the lake. Um, and so, you know, we've come full circle in our practices, I think, but, you know, we're trying to put a, a modern twist on these traditional techniques in ways that are going to be gentle on the land and uh, certainly contain nutrients flowing down uh, into the watershed and, um, you know, I'm not sure if this is going to be a viable and productive system, but I'm betting on it with my, with my money and my land. And I think it's going to be good for Lake Warner, too, keeping nutrients where they belong, uh, in the orchard and out of the lake. Um, and so I just, you know, I invite you to uh, come up. You can actually access our land through the um, Trustees of Reservations Trail. There's a trail off the corner that goes off and you get a great view and see what we're doing. We don't, we don't run off folks who wander through the land. Um, and so, yeah, I, I hope it goes well, and you'll be hearing more about it in the future. Any questions for Jonathan? John, you did a cover cropping project, too, didn't you? I did, yeah. So, so, so well, in a combination of uh, grants we got, some through the, the uh, Conservation District and some through uh, the state. Um, we were able to remove a lot of old disease uh, over around the orchard uh, and get uh, cover crop, develop, uh, put in uh, new fields with, with uh, clover and grass and to get rid of this with a kind of a poison ivy understory that we had going there. Um, and so that's been going really well. We're initiating a replanting program just in the middle of putting about 500 trees in this, this spring. Um, so yeah, it it's definitely looks like a different place than it used to about five years ago. Um, the clover and the grass were enough to push out the poison ivy? Actually, no, and, and the food wouldn't like this, but you have to till the land a lot. You have to, you have to go in there and you have to harrow it, you've got to plow it up, you've got to kill the perennial plants that are in there. And then you, then you put in the good guys after those, those plants are dead. Well, poison so, ivy in particular is yeah. very pernicious. It is. I don't like being put on the tower, so that's, that helps. Okay. Are you, are you, sorry, joking. Are you finding certain varieties that, oh, certain varieties of apples that are doing really well for you? 
Um, we, well, interestingly, you know, we planted a combination of modern disease resistant apples and some really old traditional American apples like Baldwin and Golden Russet. And I, you know, the old, the old school apples are holding their own against the modern ones, so, which is fascinating. I think the modern ones maybe have been selected to be in systems where they're fertilized a lot of spray a lot and you know, kind of coddle, whereas the old ones had to develop. You know, they had to be good apples no matter what back then because they didn't have a lot of support. Uh, mm -hmm. so. What are some of those, John? The, the, the older ones. Oh, the older ones. Well, in particular, Baldwin, Golden okay. Russet, uh, you know, those, those are standouts for us right now. Um, Jenny? What did you do with all the trees that didn't make it? Did you have to dig them up then? We chipped them. They, yeah, they, they wanted to burn them, but I, didn't, I wasn't I didn't like that idea. So, uh, yeah, we chipped them. So we have a lot of uh, apple mulch right now. We're just going to redistribute it. Uh, yeah, use it to mulch around the trees. And, uh, if you want any, help yourself. Uh, uh, <laughs> once you do that high intensity <coughs> plowing and then sowing with the cover crop, you don't yeah. have to go back and till it again? No, but, you know, if, it, if it goes well, you don't. Then, then yeah. Right. So, yeah. One more question? Yeah. I was going to tease about whether you're going to make cheese. <laughs> I wish, yeah. Well, that's another one. Another question. Yeah, another question. Friends, this last part of our workshop was a presentation by Dan Pratt of the Astarte Farm here in Hadley, Massachusetts. Dan does a lot of creative things at the Astarte Farm, and uh, including high tunnels and uh, creative plantings. I think whether you're a gardener or a grower, you'll find Dan's presentation very interesting, very educational. Take a look. Okay, last but not least, uh, we have Dan Pratt, the manager of Astarte Farm here in Hadley and he's going to speak about what you can do with NRCS funding, all sorts of things, having visited recently. I was so intrigued to see irrigation, wind breaks, high tunnels, pollinator habitat, and Right, and I have to tell you folks, I brought my no-till presentation, so I may be distracted from the, uh, from the government funding that we were able to see. And really, uh, it's been a wonderful experience to work with USDA and their Natural Resource Conservation Service, NRCS. For us, uh, they have been welcoming. They came out and did an initial conservation plan on the farm, and then it was just a matter of staying in good touch, watching a little bit of the news to see what funding has been sprung in various different farm bills. Um, Currently out on the farm, I think we have two unheated greenhouses, which we call a high tunnel. And these are fairly substantial. The widest is 26 feet wide by, I can't remember, 160 feet long. Um, we have one smaller one that's 17 feet wide. And those were almost 100% funded by a grant from the NRCS. And one of the really great things about a high tunnel, not only are you uh, eliminating a lot of the vagaries of the climate because you're controlling everything that happens underneath that sheet of plastic, but you're also greatly reducing any kind of water runoff. So in terms of water quality, I mean, we use drip irrigation, uh, and there's really very little that's escaping from that system. So we had, we had great, great luck with, with that funding. It's actually a little bit of a neat situation where I sold the farm, and the guy that bought the farm then was a new farmer. So that was how we were able to get two high tunnels out of the deal. Uh, but while I owned it, uh, we also had substantial assistance putting in a buried, I think it's a two-inch irrigation line that now feeds our entire three-and-a-half-acre operation with drip irrigation. And drip irrigation is a really nice way to keep water in the ground where it belongs and eliminate a lot of runoff. Dan, I don't see a PowerPoint presentation. It's just slides. It's just slides. Okay. If you get it up, I'll, I'll start babbling about that. So the irrigation system was another wonderful thing. And then I think the next program, and I like, I like to refer to all of these programs as the alphabet soup. 
from NRCS because there's just a whole lot of initials and it's really good if you can get a connection with someone in the office and find out which one of those alphabets applies to you. But one of the nice ones that we've been working with recently has been for pollinator habitat. And I like to really emphasize that pollinator habitat is only half the story. It's predator habitat as well. So the same flowers that are helping our bumblebees to survive, helping the honeybees to get some good pollen, it's feeding all of these small wasps and parasitizing numerous garden pests. And we've had really great luck with our cucumbers since we started all of this pollinator habitat. We used to have a lot of trouble with cucumber beetles. We didn't grow any cucumbers except in eye tunnels because we could keep most of the beetles out. And I think that we're almost to the place now where we're going to try and grow some outdoors again. And it's the same thing with peppers. We had to grow only peppers in a high tunnel because we had so many pepper maggots. We would lose sometimes 80%, 90% of a crop, beautiful red pepper with a big fat worm on the side. You know, um, it's, been, uh, it's been really interesting because they actually helped us plant all of our buffer zones. We're certified organic, so we have to have a buffer zone around our field. And they helped us plant uh, flowering shrubs. And we were lucky enough to just show up at the Hadley Garden Center at Home Depot and Lowe's, end of the season, and we bought a lot of flowering shrubs. We now have something that's flowering almost year round around our field. And we sort of sprinkled things around so that if a predator pollinator is happy over here, and they sniff something, they have to fly all the way across the field, get some more over there. We've done annual plantings. Uh, the, last, uh, the last major thing we did was almost a quarter acre of flowering shrubs. And this was not uh, a total grant, but they've given us a, a substantial amount of money for the plant material and also for the maintenance. We tend to use a lot of sheet cardboard and wood chip mulches. Because we're certified organic, we can't use any of those cardboards that have colored inks, but we found a source with only black ink, which is apparently carbon. And that has been uh, a major improvement for our farm because instead of dealing with a weed whacker on all of our paths, we've got these lovely cardboard and then a layer of wood chip pads. And we're even able to run a tractor over those and not sink into the hubs. It's been a slow process, but uh, it's really, really helped us out quite a bit. And I would like to put in a big plug for earthworms and water retention. Because one of the things when we first bought this farm we used to have three seasonal ponds, and they were basically just where a, a disc had been run over that field, spring and fall, spring and fall, spring and fall, and smeared any little clay particles into an impermeable layer. It's kind of like what you call a plow pan, but I call it a disc pan. And we just uh, left those sections of ground alone. We basically have done as little tillage as we can, particularly in the last four years. Uh, we got to no-till in sort of a strange way because we bought a little uh, Italian spading machine which was supposed to be much easier on soil structure. It's like a slow motion rototiller. It has little shovels that dig into the ground and throw the dirt straight back. And then we had grass paths, which we mowed, grass or weed paths. And within about five or six years, those weed paths had raised four to six inches above the production beds. And we'd been cover cropping, applying compost, treating them as well as we possibly could. But 
even though they would fluff up taller than the path, after a couple of rains, they would just sink, sink, sink down. And the pictures that uh, Masood was showing of the cracking of the soil surface was all over those beds. And it just was a, a sort of a click, because when you would dig, like when we put the irrigation system in, you dig across one of these grass paths, and it's, it's just riddled with holes. And you dig across one of our production beds, and it was a pancake. It was solid. So we've just completely converted the farm in the last four years to 100% no-till. And we've used the spading machine as a wheel weight when we're running the snow plow. <laughs> But we don't use it on the soil anymore at all. How many acres do you have in production? It's three and a half acres in production. It's about a six and a half acre total property, but there's house, farm, mm -hmm. these high tunnels. Um, and uh, the, uh, the other thing I wanted to talk about was mushrooms. I saw you had a picture of mushrooms growing alongside one of your plantings. And really, if we can end up with more fungal activity in our soils, not just the bacteria, but the fungi, I think that's where really a lot of the carbon sequestration is occurring. And there is an incredible economy that happens between these fungal roots and plant roots, passing on sugars and proteins. and. Uh, it reminds me of the forest and your forest garden. I love the thought of these trees and those living roots. We've done a little bit of experimentation with perennial cover crops. Uh, the one we've had the most success with in the high tunnels is a low-growing sedum. And that has made a lovely weed-free bed. And it's, it, it freely replants itself. So if you separate the plant and rip some out. It doesn't seem to mind very much. We're able to transplant right into there. That particular bed is, is actually noticeably higher than all the other beds in that high tunnel. And it's just a matter of that living room going on all the time and the, the good action happening in the soil. And I'm sorry my pretty pictures didn't come up, but... Yeah, it says... Um... The files may be damaged, corrupted, or too large. Sorry. Oh, no. Sorry. It's, my, it's my big, big file. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's a beautiful place. It is. Yeah. So I don't know if I've covered enough on NRCS. Did anybody have any questions on that? That was what I was billed to talk about. And my, I would encourage anyone with a farm to snag them and get a relationship. Uh, what, what particular crops do you grow no-till at this point? Uh, well, we grow garlic, heirloom tomatoes, lots of lettuce, um, we've got the cucumbers, we're doing a lot with cover crop cocktails, so we're actually harvesting some of our daikon radish out of that mix, um, eggplant, I, I would have to look at my crop list. It's a, it's a highly diversified farm, which is also beneficial, and we're able to keep our six-year rotation, which is, which is good for organic certification as well. Mm -hmm. Any other questions or comments, Jen? I was just going to add, uh, I work for the Conservation District, and speaking with the Farm Bill and upcoming program, we are having a workshop on May 7th at the NRCS office, and they will be talking about a little bit about some of the changes in the 2018 farm bill. Or time. It's from four to six. And it's an open meeting, and we'll have snacks. It's free, and I have had some work from NRCS on my own small farm, and having a relationship with folks over there is always beneficial. So I encourage people to think about attending. Yeah. Okay, well, thank you everybody for coming. I just want to thank again the Friends of Lake Warner for providing this space and all the snacks. Um, and it, 
really was great to see an overview of the issues that the watershed is having, a lot of <clears throat> the good things that are being done, either on the large scale, as Ms. Saud showed, on the smaller homeowner scale, as John o, um, demonstrated, and then with a couple of our local um, organic farms, it's, it's inspiring knowing that there are issues with the watershed, but also a lot being done um, to help restore it. Um, we had wished for a larger crowd, but we're happy for those who came. If you could, could all please sign in and complete a, an evaluation form. And if I have the permission of the speakers, I will gladly share also your presentations, including Dan's. We could share it perhaps on the Google Doc sure. so we could all view. Uh, and I just want to say, um, yes. if, if uh, you want to see some books that I brought here as resources, and I also have a book that I published called Permaculture Promise. It's kind of a simple intro guide to some of the things I was talking about. And so they're for sale here. Yes, there's materials here. We encourage folks to join the Friends of Lake Warner, become a member, support the good work that they're doing here. And if you have any questions, uh, you can contact me through the Conservation District email, and um, we're really delighted for your interest and your participation tonight. Thank you so much. Yeah, yes. I just want to comment. You know, it's, it's a big part of the economy around here, but if you ever wanted to have some really good hard cider, it's <laughs> under the CARS label, C-A-R-R, -R. and I tried it. <laughs> <laughs> let's let's all give it a try and support Jonathan. Yes. <laughs> On behalf of the Hamlin Conservation Hamlin Hampshire Conservation District, thank you all for coming. If we can be of any help, just give a Jen a call or, or go on on the way. Thank you. Yes, this brochure is here also for the conservation.